Tonight, MPP majority activate processes to have Parliament recalled to consider and approve President's ministerial nominees just hours after the Supreme Court dismissed an application against parliamentary approval as frivolous and abuse of the court process. And that application clearly was, was frivolous and there ought not to be any um, manipulation of what went on in court. Even Parliament itself was opposed to the application. On, on we have the latest as the main opposition NDC takes on the Chief Justice accusing the judiciary of bias in expediting the hearing of this particular case. More from the Attorney General who has revealed he got the Supreme Court to sit earlier on this case. So will he do the same for the cases against the anti-LGBTQ bill? The record we show that this particular case, for the record, it must be indicated that I specifically applied for an expedited determination of the, of the matter. I applied for an expedited hearing of the application. You applied for an expedited hearing I, in the Richie Sky I, case? I, I, so I think you should ask the plaintiff, well, the plaintiff is the one who instituted the action. I'm not going to conduct the case for a plaintiff. This is Top Story with Evans Mensah. Tonight, the MPP majority in Parliament, they have activated processes to have Parliament recalled to consider and approve President's ministerial nominees just hours after the Supreme Court dismissed an application against the parliamentary approval as frivolous and an abuse of the court processes. Now, the main opposition NDC has tonight uh, been taking on the Chief Justice in the wake of the expedited hearing of this particular case. He accused the Chief Justice of being unfair, and that case was filed by Roxing Nelson Dafiamekwa uh, against the approval of some of these ministerial nominees. And, and this was head ahead of another suit against a controversial uh, anti-gay bill passed by Parliament, which was the first to be filed. Now, these two cases are the center of the unpass between the presidency and the legislature. Uh, I want to bring in my parliamentary correspondent who is also on the legal affairs desk. He's been in Parliament uh, today, but also in court uh, today uh, for us, uh, telling us a bit of what has been happening there, uh, a day of drama. Indeed, and Kweku Asante joins us on the line right now. Kweku, uh, we'll get into the statement of the NDC shortly, but first, uh, tell us what happened in court today when this case came up. Well, Evan, so in court today, the plaintiff, that is Roxy Nelson, that Femme Four was absent. His lawyer, Nipa Kusamuado, was also absent. There was no representative for any of them either. There was also no explanation as to what might have happened. And in fact, the bailiff was put under oath to explain the circumstances under which he was able to serve the lawyers for Roxy Nelson, that Femme Four. According to him, when he did go to the law firm of Nipa Kusamuado, he met a lady called Na who said she was under the instruction of Nita Kosamuado not to receive any court summons or any court process whatsoever. The Attorney General pressed to have him suspended or some disciplinary action taken against him. But ultimately, when it came to the case, the Supreme Court decided that despite the absence of the NDCMP and his lawyers, they were going to go ahead and hear this case. They first heard from the Speaker of Parliament's lawyers in the person of Tadio Sori, who disagreed with the NDC MP and actually urged the Supreme Court to dismiss the application. And then it was a time to hear from the Attorney General, Godfrey Kepoadamit, who also held the same view as the Speaker of Parliament, that the, the text for the Supreme Court to grant an interlocutory injunction has not been met in this case, and then the applicant has not sufficiently, as it were, made a case to show that any, any harm, irreparable harm, as, as you say, will be done to him if the case it is, is to go ahead without the injunction being granted. So ultimately, the five-member panel presided over by the Chief Justice herself unanimously dismissed the application injunction. And in the words of the Chief Justice, they were frivolous, 
and it was an abuse of the processes of the court. And did the court say anything about the absence of the plaintiff in this particular matter and the lawyer? Yes, Evan. The court decided that there have been no explanation as to why the lawyer and the, 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 the lawyer and the client were not all in court. And in fact, the plaintiff the bailiff was able to show that despite the lawyer allegedly refusing to receive these summons and other court documents, that was going to show when the court case was going to head. He left the court documents, and the court construed that as having been served. And so having been served, there was nothing to stop the court from going ahead to hear this case. So the Supreme Court proceeded to hear the case in the absence of the plaintiff and his lawyers, and proceeded to render judgment. And what's the Attorney General's reaction to the ruling, and what does he expect Parliament to do now? Well, the Attorney General is clear that is the Speaker of Parliament erred when he decided to adjourn the House. He wants the House to as it were, as a matter of agency, we can to come and consider those agent government business that are currently outstanding. He also says, just like the Supreme Court has said, the case was frivolous from the start. And that the application clearly was, was frivolous, and there ought not to be any um, manipulation of what went on in court. Even Parliament itself was opposed to the application. On, on the cases that are being heard, there are those who have taken the view that some cases were filed two weeks prior to this case being filed, and the Supreme Court has proceeded to deal with it. The Chief Justice himself has raised issues about persons not prosecuting their own cases. Well, what do you make of that? Yes, I mean, as I said, it's most unfortunate that persons will file up processes before the court and then fail to take an interest in it. And indeed, even when the same application for Ntogo to injunction and spending has not been determined a day before they proceed to go and file another application for Ntogo to injunction. There cannot be a greater demonstration of, of, of a desire to abuse the court's process than this. Clearly it shows an attempt to frustrate the, the Republic from pursuing its business and law. And that is why it's necessary that um, as lawyers for the Republic we take a keen interest in whatever happens and we make sure that such things are, are dealt with so that um, the state business can proceed. On record um, in Parliament is, is a letter that I wrote to the Speaker asking him to reconsider his decision and all. So I expect Parliament, after having come to the Supreme Court to oppose this application, to also um, reconvene and, and deal with the, the matter relating to the approval of the, of the ministers. There's nothing at all that impedes or inhibits Parliament from, from doing its work they ought to do their work. And I think that the adjournment of proceedings was most unjustified yes, and, and, and uncalled for. And Craig, who are the center of this controversy, are two cases, one of which has just been looked at by the Supreme Court and dismissed after just been reporting. The other case relates to the Richard Sky case against the anti-gay bill, which the president has cited for his reason uh, not to receive the bill, although it's been passed by parliament. Now, there are concerns about that from the NDC. We'll come to that pretty shortly. But that case was filed before this particular one, but has been heard already. You've been putting that question to the Attorney General, and he's been disclosing that he actually got the Supreme Court to, to hear this particular case expeditiously. Yes, in fact, in the NDC statement that we'll get into pretty shortly, the NDC made the case that it is the Chief Justice and the Supreme Court that had prioritized this case over the anti-LGBTQ bill case. But right after this case, the Attorney General actually now revealed that he is the one who got the court to hear this expeditious. Of course, it does not explain how he was able to do that. But I put the question to him. If you are so much interested in this and you are getting expedited hearing for this also, are you going to get the Supreme Court to sit on that case as early as practicable? I mean, the Richard Alak Skies case. He says, well, he's not interested in that. And as far as he's concerned, if Richard Alaska himself is not interested in prosecuting the case, or the Speaker of Parliament himself who is a party, do not move processes to get the case heard, then the status quo will, will maintain. Is it the position that if Richard Sky does not prosecute this case, the Supreme Court is not going to hear it, and the, 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 the hand of the President is going to be stayed on this bill up until Richard Sky decides that he takes an, he takes an interest in this matter? Well, if, if Richard Sky does not prosecute the matter, the application will, will be dismissed. <laughs> the process he has filed in court will be dismissed. Yes, yes. But so, said, and, but, hold on, hold on. I think that the duty to fix the date for hearing rests in the registry of the, of the Supreme Court. And I do not understand where this business of people actually um, scrutinizing when applications are faced for hearing or why this application is only for hearing even came from. The argument Back in the days, if we file an application in the Supreme Court of Ghana, it takes even three months for you to have a date for hearing.
It is only after a party has made an application for an expeditious determination of the, of the process that the matter will come up for hearing. And indeed, in, in the record, we show that this particular case, for the record, it must be indicated that I specifically applied for an expedition determination of the, of the matter. I applied for an expedited hearing of the application. So it is not the Supreme Court of Ghana uh, picking and choosing which applications to hear and not to, not to hear. Any party to any matter, back in the days I used to do it even when I was in opposition. So indeed, it is always the prerogative of the Supreme Court registry to face applications for hearing. And if the date for hearing has not been fixed or is perhaps too far, it is incumbent on the party to apply to the Chief Justice in accordance with the, um, the Courts Act and the Constitution of the Republic for an expedited hearing. You that, file for an expedited hearing uh, in the Chief Sky case? Uh, uh, so, I, I think you should ask the plaintiff. Well, the plaintiff is the one who instituted the action. The plaintiff is the one who instituted the, the action, and the plaintiff ought to um, bear the responsibility for, 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 for the conduct of the, of the matter. I'm not going to conduct the case for the plaintiff. And quickly, why is the Attorney General pushing for Roxing Nelson, the Femmecos lawyer, to be punished by the court? Well, today the bailiff under oath actually explained to the court that when he did go to meet Papu Samuado's law firm to serve him with certain court processes, the instruction that Nick Papu Samuado had given some members of the firm was that he should not receive anything from the court. And the Attorney General says he considers that the highest form of disrespect. In fact, in court today, he pushed on two different occasions to get a five-member panel to take a tougher stance against the lawyer. The, the court have said that they are not going to take any decision now, and in the words of the chief justice, they will look at that at a later date. But the attorney general is still pressing that some action ought to be taken against the Papu Samuado. For a lawyer who has filed an application in the matter to direct a rejection of the affidavit of position that has been filed by the other side, I mean, it is, it's really, for me, gross professional misconduct. With as it may, uh, the court proceeded to deal with the matter, and, and, and that is it. Um, I think that was very unfortunate, especially as the same counsel was in the same day filing processes in the Supreme Court of Ghana. Earlier in the morning, he was rejecting processes from the Supreme Court of Ghana, and then in the afternoon, he proceeded to file uh, processes in the same Supreme Court of Ghana. And I think the processes of the highest court of the Republic ought to be respected. The dignity and authority of the court always ought to be protected and respected by all counsel. And that is the point I sought to make in court. And I want to run and bring in the director of legal uh, at the NDC's legal directorate, Edwiji Tamaklo on the line right now because the party has issued a statement and they're very unhappy with the Supreme Court for expediting the hearing of this particular case when the other case which was filed earlier by Rachel Sky is yet to be heard. You know, those two uh, cases are the heart of this standoff between the judiciary, uh, the uh, parliament itself and the presidency. Now, as you know, the judiciary has been placed in the center of this whole controversy. He joins us right now on the telephone line. Edwiji, thanks for your time here on Top Story. Good evening, uh, Ivan, and good evening to your listeners. You've raised concerns about the. You've raised concerns about fairness. You've also asked the uh, judiciary to rectify this immediately because it's entrenching the perception that they are biased against the NDC. But the Attorney General just explained to us that he made an application to the court for expedited hearing. Doesn't that clear this up? It doesn't. In fact, <clears throat> this revelation by the Attorney General even makes the concern raised by the NDC even more grievous. Why do I say so? The rules of court allows the party, as it were, to apply for abridgment of time. If the person so believes that the matter is so urgent that the original date the hearing of the matter may cause a certain harm or, you know, damage. And for that matter, prefers expedition. What you do is that you file a formal application. And by way of formal application, the other party is duly served. Then the parties appear before a panel 
the Supreme Court reserved that it could be one person. Then that panel, she's with jurisdiction to hear the substantive matter, will now say that on the basis of this application for abridgment of time and the depositions accompany it, the court is so minded to abridge time to allow for expeditious hearing. In this case, let me put on record, and again, the Supreme Court is the court of record, the attorney there has never filed any application for abridgment of time. How do you know this? It's on record. He never filed. In fact, the only process the attorney there filed was an affidavit in opposition to the application for injunction. Where did the Supreme Court of Ghana sit to consider the application for abridgment of time? No such. It was purely an ex parte communication between Godfrey Ebu Adami and whoever set the date for today. He never copied the lawyers for the other party. In fact, it was only a daily notice sent to appear in court today that was alleged to have been served on them. So in the absence of a formal application, question, was it a telephone call from Godfrey Adami? Was it a letter written by Mr. Godfrey Ebu Adami? How did he do the application? And this for us is a worrying trend. Why do we say it is worrying? They are two similarly placed injunction applications. Two by Richard Delasca and Dr. Amanda Odo. These two applications were earlier filed. Meanwhile, Godfrey Yewadami, according to him, he applied not for a seditious hearing of the two applications filed earlier in time, but for the application filed by H. Yeah, but but you know why, right? He's explained that. This particular case, he's been, what, he's been what cited. What explanation did he provide? Well, his explanation is that the Richard Sky case, the Richard Sky's case, if he wanted expedited hearing of the case, he should take that particular step. But this no, case but is a case that he's interested in. Adami the plaintiff in the Dafyama policy? Well, but he is the chief legal advisor to the government and to the and to the presidency, as you know, and this is a subject that he has already written to the Speaker of Parliament about because it affects the confirmation of the nominees. So he's interested, and that is why he takes this matter to the Supreme Court. First of all, no, first of all, the suit by Amanda, the suit by Rachel the last guy, the attorney general is a party. The attorney general is a party. So if he could apply for expeditious hearing in the Roxanne Dafiamma pursuit, what prevented him from doing so? In the same suit that he's a party. Yeah, but that, that doesn't mean that he's done anything wrong. He is obviously deciding what cases to pursue, which every attorney general is allowed no, to do. No, you see, your, 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 your journalist asked him a question, and I was listening to the interview. When your journalist asked him, how come you are not applying for a expeditious hearing in the richest car? He said, I am not the plaintiff, unquote. The suit that the Supreme Court heard today, Godfrey Diego Adami, was he the plaintiff or is he the plaintiff? Mr. Evans Menza, is Godfrey Diego Adami the plaintiff in the suit that the Supreme Court heard today? That's a question that the Attorney General should answer. No, but, but... it is not a question for him to answer. It's a question you know. He is not the plaintiff. But and in this particular case, as I pointed out, that we have raised, as I pointed out, you know he's already written to the speaker, objecting to the position that the speaker took to freeze the hearing of the confirmation by the MPs of the ministerial nominees. He's already stated his position on this matter. It is in that no. same vein that he decides to go to the Supreme Court for expedited hearing on the matter. No, what I'm telling you is that by what mode? Did he go to the Supreme Court for expedited hearing? He did not indicate, but he says no, he, but he the got the Supreme Court to do. No, but the record has indicated to you that the Supreme Court of Ghana is a court of record. 
even if it's an oral application, it's an application made before a panel of the Supreme Court, be it a sole judge or a panel of judges. The Supreme Court has not sat on the matter of H.A. Dafia Mako versus Speaker and the Attorney General, for which reason an oral or formal application has been made to a bridge time. No but but you're, not, you're not a party to that case, so you can't possibly know if it's made an oral No, 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 no. I mean, the, the Supreme Court doesn't sit, quote-unquote, in a room. The Supreme Court brought out its revised court list for this week. In fact, if you read the headed, it is revised. It means that there was an original cost list in that cost list. Your call has been put there on was... hold. Please wait. Uh, apologies there. Uh, we'll try and rectify that for you pretty quickly. As uh, so did you speak so we can have clarity uh, with his line uh, to us. But he's making a fundamental point about the revelation that the Attorney General uh, gave us today that this expedited hearing is something that he had instigated. The question he's asking is, did this, did this happen uh, formally? We'll try and interrogate if this is uh, a process in court that is known. Uh, and, and yes, uh, apologies, your line was interrupted pretty shortly. Uh, you were making a substantive point. Yes. Evan, is it better now? It is. Okay, thank you. So, like I pointed out, when you file a formal application before the Supreme Court of Ghana, the court can sit with a sole judge or a panel of judges. In the specific case of Roxanne Dafiamoko versus the Speaker and others, today is the first time the Supreme Court has constituted a panel to hear this matter. When the matter came up for hearing today, it was not in respect or to consider an application to a brief time to hear the injunction application. No. Two, the hearing notice that was, as it were, served on the plaintiff was for him to appear in court today for the hearing of the substantive injunction application and not to consider any application to average time. So when the attorney general makes the point that he applied for the expeditious hearing, the question that comes obviously is that by what mode? Was it a letter? Was it by a telephone conversation? How did you do that? Stay with me. Stay with me, Aduji. Let me bring in a private legal practitioner, Bobby Bansi, into the conversation. Uh, Bobby, so as we have it now, the Supreme Court decided to hear this case today. The AG just disclosed that he indeed made an application uh, for this to happen. Uh, as you've just been listening to, Eddie G says there isn't any record to show that a formal application was put in and that if, even if it was an oral application, he's not aware of the Supreme Court sitting on this matter. What is the standard procedure if you want an expedited hearing of a case? Good, good um, evening, Evans, and good evening to your listeners. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay. I, I am not sure what the Attorney General meant by he put in an application or he instigated the hearing of the matter. Let, let, let me say what I know about the practice or the procedure in the Supreme Court. There is, in respect of the Dafia Moto case, there is a substantive risk that is the originating process of the matter. That substantive rate has not been heard. That substantive rate going to the merits of the claim or the reliefs endorsed on the rate filed by the lawyers for Honorable Dafia Method. That has not been determined as far as the information I have now. Now, on the back of that rate, an application for interlocutory injunction was filed by the lawyers of Honorable Dafia Metal. Hello, Evans, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay. Now, when that application was filed, I am not on that application. I stand to be corrected. Was there an original return date? This is a question you are asking of. Um, yes, because I, I haven't. Heard... I haven't seen the, the specific documents. Okay, so when the interlocutory application was filed, 
it was indicated that a date to be fixed. And that has become the standard practice. That when you file an application in the appellate court, you are not given a date. You are given it when the process is given to the right a date to be fixed. And then you are let, later given a letter that the registry, the registrar of the court would serve you a hearing notice to appear on a certain date. Now, in this case, when the motion for interlocutory application for interlocutory injunction was filed, no hearing, no date was put on that motion itself. They received a letter that they would be given a date to appear. Now, subsequently, they were given a date by a hearing notice to appear today. Now, the issue of abridgment of time only comes in if you have an original date, a return date, an original one. And for some reason, you want the matter heard earlier than the original date given to you by the registry of the court. You must then file an application on notice to all the parties involved, justifying why you cannot wait for that original date. That is the process for abridgment of time. Now, in this particular case, the Honorable Dafia pursuit, there was no original date given. There was no original date given. And so the first time that a hearing notice was sent on all the parties to appear was this 20th. Sorry, was for today. And so I do not know what the Attorney General means by... He, I didn't... I've not had the interview, but from what you are saying, that is what he seemed to have suggested, that he instigated for the case to be heard earlier. It seems to suggest that there may have been an earlier date served on the parties, and he abridged it. I don't know what he meant by that process. So, thankfully, Bobby, the Attorney General just joined us. Let's clarify this, and let's okay. settle this particular uh, debate. Uh, thank you very much, Gofo Yubadami, for joining us. Right. right. Thank you very much. Can you please Ibadami. clarify that? Did the interview you gave uh, my reporter in, in, in court today, when you said and that... I think that um, used, yeah. I have agreed to speak to you because of the ignorance that is being put out there. A lot of ignorant and misleading information is being put out there. And I consider it my duty as a Minister for Justice to correct this. Because indeed, it has a grave implication for the administration of justice in the country. Ghana's judiciary has a very solid reputation out, out there within the Commonwealth. It's one of the most respected institutions in the justice delivery system in the Commonwealth of Nations. And for that matter, wrong impressions that are bandied about to solve the middle integrity are of concern to me, especially when they are unfounded and premise on false on false counts. The issue is simple. As was explained by the lawyer you spoke to earlier on, no date has been fixed for the hearing of the application by Dafi Mapo. And for that matter, the issue of abridgment of time doesn't even arise at all. Edwin Tomaku doesn't even understand <laughs> the workings of the rules of court. An application for abridgment of time for hearing of the matter comes in when you have time, a setting or fixed time, fixed for the hearing of the relevant process we're talking about. And you seek to bring the date for it. That is when we talk about abridgment of time. You are abridging the time. You are bringing it for it. Where no date has been fixed, it is absolutely the duty of a party interested in the matter to cause the matter to be fixed for hearing. So I certainly wrote a letter to Her Ladyship, the Honorable Chief Justice of the Republic, asking for an expedited hearing of the matter and asking for an early date for hearing. That's a letter on record, as is done by all practitioners where they are sought, all practitioners who know the workings and rules of court. So, and, and I you know did this to in that the point absence? That indeed, I have done this many, many times. 15, 16 years ago, I made the first application, about maybe eight years ago, to the, I remember the dentist justice, Aqua. I sent an application to him, asking for an expedited hearing of a matter. He granted it. Even recently, in the Supreme Court case, 2011, that time, Edwin Tomaklo was my student in the Ghana School of Law. <laughs> it's a matter of record. I applied for an extra hearing of this um, um, famous Van for, for France matter. 
and the two gases then granted the application and the matter was said in the vacation from day to day. So really, it is not unusual, it is not extraordinary, it is not out of place for a party in the matter to cause a matter to be listed for hearing or cause for the matter to be, to be set down for hearing. So what, what does it have value about NDC's uh, press statement and all that about the matter? Indeed, what interest does a party have in not having a matter heard early? If you are a plaintiff in a matter and your matter is, is, is being heard early, wouldn't you be happy? It clearly it shows that the purpose of filing the action was not to, to, to have the Supreme Court actually determine it, but just to cause mischief. And that mischief is what I sought to deal with by causing the matter to be heard expeditiously. And that was in accord with the Constitution of the Republic and also in accord with the Court Act. The Court Act vests the Chief Justice with the duty and the power to empanel courts all over the country. And if a party is of the view that his matter ought to be heard, the party has to have recourse to the, to the rules governing the, the court process, including when, the Court Act. When did you... have, it shows clearly when the NDC will speak this way. It shows a total lack of understanding or total ignorance about the rules of court. When did you write and, this and, letter? And I wrote the letter on Monday. It's a matter, I can give you a copy tomorrow. And this is, 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 I mean, these are matters within the administrative authority or leadership of chief justice. Fixing a date for hearing, fixing a court or constituting a court all over the country, from the Supreme Court to the district court. I mean, this, this, this lends itself to no controversy. And this letter you letter. wrote, and this letter you wrote, came on the day on Monday when you still didn't know when the Supreme Court had fixed this substantive matter for? It came on a day when there was no date for the hearing and I caused the matter to be to be heard early. I wrote for the for the for the Chief Justice to exercise their powers, to exercise their prerogative under the Constitution and the Courts Act to cause the matter to be set down for hearing and heard expeditiously. And it's an application that is very constitutional, that is very legal and that is now called the rules of court. As simple as that. And so, and I think that indeed they are asking how come this matter is said before another matter. The rules of, I mean, there is no basis at all for such argument. If that were the case, how come this matter um, openly has stayed in the court for about eight years? That one, Edith Tomaclu and, and his elk are not interested in it. They're not concerned about openly having dragged on for seven, eight years. Why are they not concerned about that one? And that accused persons have had their judgment delivered and, and, and convicted and thrown into jail within a year or two of the matter being commenced. They're not interested in op- opening, being, or having dragged on in the court for seven, eight years. So what is this thing about, I mean, we should not reduce the administration of justice to this. Are, are, you, aware, of justice are, are, are you aware, general, are you aware when you wrote this letter, uh, Mr. Dami, on Monday? Pardon? Are you aware when you wrote this letter, if the, the lawyers for Roxy and Daffy Ameko were informed? It is not if, if a party writes for a matter to be set down for hearing. The party does not notify the other side. Yeah, it is I, for I the register of the court. I, I, I do notify. know. I, I Hold know on. That. I'm just let, asking let, if you are aware. It is for the register of the court to notify the other side by a hearing notice, and that was duly done. That is why the belief for the court was called before the court today to testify on oath as to how he did his his work, and indeed he testified that he duly served the lawyers on that side. The lawyers on that side rejected the process and asked for it to be retained and all, and that he left it at the office of the, of the law firm, which is due service. And, and the lawyers on that side are not cont- contesting the service on them. I was also notified. I did not know when the matter would be set, set down for you. I only applied to the Chief Justice for an isolated hearing of the matter, and the Chief Justice fixed today, and we were all notified. We were all served by a hearing notice. Heritage was served on me, and I showed up in court. Heritage was served on Mr. Tadosori, sorry, counsel for Parliament, and and, the, and Parliament was duly represented not only by, through its counsel but even by a party, the deputy director of legal or director of the drafting in Parliament showed up in court. So really, those absolute compliance with due process, and I think that we must stop throwing dust into the eyes of the success of, 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 of the lay public. Uh, and that's the Attorney General. Please stay with me because Eddie G uh, is still with me on the line. Eddie G, he's provided the clarity. He wrote this letter on Monday and the Supreme Court, of course, the Chief Justice has the power to decide when to constitute the panel to hear any case, acted on that letter. And he says, and in, again, it was in court today, it was before the courts, that the, uh, the Roxanne Nelson, the family the lawyers, were duly served 
doesn't that clear up the questions you were asking earlier? It doesn't at all. The attorney general knows that when you are writing a letter, an ex party communication of this nature, to the ladyship, the chief justice, you copy your opponent. You Evans, copy. Evans, if I may come in, that is totally That's wrong. That's for ABC the, reason. The letter I, I wrote this to me, letter. Mr. Dami, if you may, Mr. Dami, if you may, I, 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 I would definitely give an opportority to correct that. If you wrote your statement, statement. Hold yourself. Mr. Dami, he's been on. I'm saying, I'm saying that the letter you wrote to the chief justice, 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 he was pretty quiet on the line whilst you explained and allowed you to explain because indeed it's important for us to have clarity. Let him make his point and then you can definitely give us your own thoughts on what he had said if indeed you still have something to say. So we can have a, a very decent conversation that audiences can also understand. You said at the beginning, this is important for people to have clarity about. Let, them, let me just hear him for a second. Yes, Eduji. Yeah, so the point I was making is that because to avoid ex party communication, what you do is that you copy the lawyer on the other side that for a b c d reason i think this matter that we are handling i want expedited uh, here so i've written this letter you copy the other person so that the other person is in the known that this is what you are doing in this case, no such happened. So this whole business that somebody doesn't appreciate the fact that you can write a letter, the practice is to copy the other side. That is what you do. In this case, the other side, which is the lawyer, was only served on the, with a yearly notice to appear in court. Not as to communication whether the matter should be heard today. Two distinct matters. So why are we trying to confuse the issues? By the time the hearing notice had been served or whatever on the plaintiff, the understanding is that the court has acted on your ex party letter or application you claim. So that is a point that ought to be made. Yes, go for your brother, me. What, anyway, what, hello, what so, lawyer, so, this hello, is what lawyer, this or Rothstein, copied in this letter? Yeah, you asked the question. Uh, let's the attorney general answer. Right. Again, a lot of ignorance is being put out there. Mm. And I'm saying that, for the record, a letter written by a party to cause the matter listed for hearing or to be heard, either to the registrar or the chief justice, is not a judicial process. The judicial process is the hearing notice that will be issued pursuant to the letter. And he, he knows it. If, uh, if he doesn't know it, then indeed it will be class ignorance of the highest order. That if a party is writing to the register of the court or the chief justice asking for a matter to listen for hearing, there is no way you copy the other side. You propose a date in it. In, in this case, I did not even propose a date at all. I only asked for an extra hearing on the matter. And the hearing notice, which is supposed to be the judicial process, was duly served on the parties. And that is what is supposed to be done. And that's what made the point that we must stop debasing the image of the judiciary. We must stop debasing law parties in this manner through all these unwanted comments about the integrity of the judiciary when indeed there is absolutely no concern at all. I think that in this matter, and I do not even see why there's, there's such a problem. Council for Parliament, which is actually the affected party, was even in support of my opposition to the application. He supported my opposition to the application because the application filed by the firm of was totally frivolous and, and baseless. And that for me is actually the point of interest. Uh, substantively, so they, substantively, the matter has been so, dismissed. So when the Speaker of Parliament adjourned proceedings in the manner in which he did on the basis of this application, only for his own lawyer to turn up in court and, and oppose, oppose the Speaker of Parliament. Substantively on that subject, though, uh, now that the matter has been dismissed, you've written to the Speaker already objecting to his decision to suspend the hearing uh, when it comes to the ministers who were nominated. Are you taking further steps to ensure that the verdict of the court today on this matter is implemented by Parliament now that they're on recess? 
Well, I think Parliament was in court. Parliament was represented through its lawyer. And I know the lawyer, very decent practitioner, no doubt will do the proper thing by notifying his client and all. And at least for, for now, it's been cleared, this issue of agreement of time that was raised by Eki Tamaklo. You see that the argument is flawed. So you, so, you leave, so, so you you leave don't parliament know, they some education sometimes it matters. there's no need for any appearance of time yeah. when a matter Mr. Um, 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 has not been listed for so, hearing so you leave parliament to act on the ruling today and you expect them to in essence no i'm saying that council for parliament was in court nominees. council for parliament had a ruling and clearly in accordance with due process i'm sure he will instruct his client and i'm saying that indeed the core by me for parliament to reconsider the decision made by the speaker has even been made more imperative mm. by this ruling. Uh, and thankfully, we've just been joined by Nika Kosamuado, and he represents Roxing Nelson Dafiameko eh, in this particular matter. And today, the bailiff was uh, hauled before the court and asked questions because it emerged today in court, it was reported, that an attempt was made to serve the processes on Nika Kosamuado. And the report was that the, there was a rejection of this. Uh, Nick Pakosamado, thank you for your time here on on, on Newsnight. Hello, Nick Pakosamado. Hello, Nick Pakosamado. Okay, well, we may have lost him on the line. Uh, we also have uh, Bobby Bansing still with us and Eduji Tamaklo also uh, with us on this. And if you're just joining us today, a major day in court, as you know, that tussle between the legislature and the executive has been playing out uh, ever since the LGBTQ bill was passed. Uh, it, it came to a head today when the court had to decide on another aspect of this that had prevented the president's nominees from being confirmed by parliament because the speaker had referred to this application uh, before the courts. That is the subject of some controversy tonight. Uh, thankfully, Nick Pakosamado joins us right now. Hello, Nick Pakosamado. Thanks for your time here on Newsnight. Hi, Eva. Yes. So, is it true that you rejected the processes when no. the Baileys attempted yeah, to that, that, that's, that's completely untrue. And it's quite unfortunate that the Baileys of the court would, on oath, tell a bare face lie to the court. Now, this is the, 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 the narration of events. I received a call, and luckily I have the record, from the Bailiff of the court at 10.50 a.m. yesterday. I was not in Accra at that particular moment. So I told him that I unfortunately could not receive whatever ah, process that is, he had. Sorry, Later. sorry, Akule. Oh, hello? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So I said yesterday at 10.50 a.m., I received a phone call from a bailiff of the Supreme Court who said he had a process that he wanted to serve on me. Unfortunately, I was not in Accra at the moment. So I told him that he should take the number of Honorable Roxton and ensure that he delivers the process to him. And I sent him the number at 10.57 a.m. And he said, received with thanks. That was the last time I dealt with the belief. Now, this belief later on apparently goes to my office and says that I don't tell himself at the front desk and says he's a bailiff of the court and that he has a process to serve. He takes out the process and then puts it on the table. Now, the secretary cites the process with my name on it and told him that, oh, I wasn't in the office, but if he could wait and let me sign him when I came or when he got in contact with me. He said he wanted to call his boss and confirm whether that should be what he should do. That was the last time anybody heard of it. He told them he was making a phone call and he'll be back. So nobody signed for the process because he said he was making a phone call and would be back. Luckily, we have a CCTV system in our office with an audio capacity. So we have him on CCTV and I'll put the CCTV out. And you have him Whatever on CCTV? Whatever he said was a blatant lie. You mean what he told the court today? He and told no, the court, and see, I he, he, he was under that. oath before and the court. Quoted, yes, and quoted that, and quote, he says, I had instructed my clerk at the front desk to refuse the court process in that particular case. Why would I say that? 
That is what he told the court. You're saying you exactly. didn't instruct and anybody. that is what is on his effect report. And luckily, we have the CCTV with the audio on it. When he and left, so I have sent it out for you to listen to it. It is not true. In court today, he also said that when this happened, he left the documents there at front desk and left. So he told the front desk people he was making a call to the registrar to clarify whether he should wait for me to come and sign or whether he should leave. And he never came back. And so you see, normally when you bring a process to our front desk, you sign for it and you also record you as having come with the date and everything because we have a process which is not of our office. So why would we not accept the process? So, but why were you not in court today, though? Precisely because I wasn't in the office yesterday. And so clearly, when he brought and left the document there, nobody had touched it. So nobody opened no, the document to no, check we, which we date We didn't even know what it was. We didn't even know who he was. That was the sad thing. And I wasn't even in the office the whole day. But be that it may, once the court said it has been left there, it was proper service, we let it go. If the court has already ruled, so what can you do? I mean, but everybody knew it was widely reported that this case was going to be heard today. Really? I was mean, I'm, I'm a journalist. I knew. That this case was going to be heard today? Yeah, I'm a journalist. I knew it was going to be heard today. And well, so you were a journalist. You knew the case was going to be heard today. I didn't know. You weren't there. Your client was also not there. Yeah. And the court has ruled. What can we say? <laughs> what, what about... At the, least the substantive case is still pending. It is. Yes. So are, you aware, are you aware I mean, of... When you file an injunction, it can be granted, it can be dismissed. What can you do? The only other thing was that we had filed two injunctions because the second one was... We were going to withdraw the first one to replace with the second one. So you can understand why the court said it was duplicitous. Yes, because it was two injunctions. We were going to withdraw one and then have one head. But anyway, that has already happened. So we live by, by the court's decision. We respect it. What can you say? Even though you disagree with it, that is the decision of the court. Did, so I, hear, did I just hear you say that you are putting in another injunction application on the separate matter? No, 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 no. We, I said we have put in two injunction applications. That is why you heard the court. We were going to withdraw one when we were in court. That is why, unfortunately, because we were not there, the court described the two applications as being duplicious duplicating each other uh -huh. are you aware of a letter rating on monday by the attorney general asking for an expedited hearing of this oh it is it is not it is not abnormal even though normally you would have expected him to come maybe by a motion he says he filed the letter we were not copied though but if he says he filed the letter asking for an expedited hearing of the matter that he can write because we have also, but in our case, in the mandamus, we have filed a formal application for abridgment of time. So if he filed a letter, unfortunately, we were not copied. At least maybe they are copied us, we would then have been able to speak to it. But he didn't copy us. And if the court had granted him the um, expedited hearing by issuing us hearing notices, well, that is the court. And you have no grievance with, with that? Oh, but of course, we would have loved to have been notified. Obviously, if he had, if the letter had come, then we would be in a position to have maybe be in the know that, of course, then the matter is going to be to be heard. Yes, normally Supreme Court hearing notices are issued, but normally there's time. There's time. We have a pending judgment in the the same rocks in, in the um, first lady and second lady matter. The date has been. Normally, it's long. You know, there are periods in between. Uh -huh. So parties are well informed and well ahead. But clearly, in this case, unfortunately, with this, so maybe you should ask for a copy of the letter and see when it was issued, when it was received. Then you could make a proper analysis of the situation. Uh, uh, but it is once he says he issued the letter and it wasn't the court registry that issued the hearing notice independently. That is a that is a statement. So then maybe you could ask. For a copy of the letter, they will know when it was issued and when the hearing notice was issued. So this clears this up now because you, of course, are a party to the case. You said you don't have an issue with him writing on Monday and asking for a bit of time, which is something that you did. He didn't tell you he wrote on Monday. Yeah, he said he wrote it on Monday. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. Yeah, I you don't have any that. issue with that because you say it's a, it's normal process. No, so this is what I've said. I've said that 
you can file a letter or you can file an application. If you file a letter, maybe clearly the advice the other parties involved, we would probably be should be given a notice of that letter. You understand? Because it is a letter that affects the rights of all the parties involved. But clearly we were not copied. And so unless I see a copy of the letter, I have to take that any general word for it. Uh, but it 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 it's a bit out of the norm when the date is that close. Because if you file the letter on Monday and the hearing of it was treated on Tuesday, that is not the normal um period of time that the Supreme Court normally issues its hearing notices. Because for hearing notices of the Supreme Court, they normally have a bit of time. But that's why it may depend on the content of the letter. So we will all love to see a copy of the letter. And I hope you will be able to ask him to give you a copy of the letter. Uh, go for it, brother, man. Yes. Um, I think I, um, I must admire the grace shown by um, Nipapo Tamado. And indeed, that is how all practitioners ought to conduct themselves, especially in, in the public space. Yes, Kanda and all that. And clearly, as has been stated by Nick Papo, as well as um, Bobby Panson, that you were speaking to before, it is not extraordinary, it is not unusual for such a process to be resorted to. That is an application to a lady, the two justice, to exercise their powers under the Constitution and also the Court Act to cause an extraordinary hearing of a matter. And that is what we did. Um, I have nothing further to add to that. I am saying that clearly the process are resorted to where known to the law, it's within the law, is up to parties to familiarize themselves with the rules governing proceedings in court. And so Eddie Tamako and Co. who scream loud and on, on various platforms and allege that there has been a violation of due process and cite rules which do not apply. Today, he's talking about agreement of, of time, and it's been shown to him by another lawyer as well as myself that the issue of agreement of time doesn't even arise at all. So clearly it shows that he's unfamiliar with the rules of court. It was a tamakura, I mean. And so really, I mean, we must, as I said once again, stop unnecessarily attacking the judiciary where there's no cause at all. That is what I say. Uh, this, uh, but this but process was th there's still one case of standing, the uh, Richard Sky case. You were asked in court by my reporter uh, whether you would take the same approach in that particular uh, case. You said well, the approach I adopted in this matter was informed by the... Um, implication this had for state business in parliament. Apart from this approval of ministers, there were very serious financial matters that had been adjourned by the Speaker of Parliament on account of this matter. And that is why this, and the court is actually even going on an Easter break. And I'm sure that is why the Supreme Court actually faced the hearing for today. Yes, the, the, there is a regular legal vacation at Easter time. There are three legal vacations in a year. And it's up to parties to plan the way they conduct their cases. If you do not plan your case well and enforce within the Christmas break, so be it. The court will, the Supreme Court will not, will not hear your matter. So there's no way any case can be heard next week or in two weeks. And the courts are going to need a break. That's except the matter that of record. It's case, something that's known to the rules of court. Except that in the Richard Sky case, uh, not just because general. of this one. In the, and the point, case, uh, in the Richard Sky case, Attorney General, there is a, a bill passed by Parliament which is also in limbo. It also uh, has constitutional implications that also, many will argue, requires an expedited hearing to settle this matter, considering its high-profile nature and how it's become a, a pretty divisive subject. Yes, but, but I'm saying that it, there are many parties to the action. The Speaker of Parliament and what, is a party to the matter. He's represented in the matter through the same council. Um, Rich Kai also as a lawyer. And I'm explaining the peculiar circumstances which resulted in the application being made. I don't know whether the same considerations hold for that matter. Of course, I expect the Supreme Court to, to, to deal with the matter as quickly as possible. But I've adverted your mind to the fact that there's, a, there's an Easter vacation coming up. And the Supreme Court will not hear any matter for some time now. But you will not apply for the day, so hearing please, of that I mean, stop this unnecessary um, play to the gallery. No, it's the a question. question there's, a, there's an there's an Easter vacation. It is in the yes, court. It, it is in the, the rules of court. Return. I'm asking yes. categorically. You will not apply for an expedited. I, hearing I, I do not. Please, I do not do my cases. Or did, did I inform the public about the letter that I was writing before I wrote it? I never did it. Did I? 
I mean, just I never informed the, the public that I was writing a letter before I wrote it. Mm. <laughs> so, please, uh, stop. I did not do my case in the media. And I did not review my strategies well, in the my, media. My question is simple. And I'm what saying that we are actually <laughs> constrained by even the Easter vacation and, and what have you. Indeed, even if I write to CJ, it's up to the two justices. The two justices can, it's an exercise of uh, administrative discussion by the two justices. So that, that request, <laughs> maybe it's not. Yeah, and this is the first time I'm waiting for the two justices asking for a, a special hearing of various matters. Some have been granted, some have not been granted. Yeah, but the question is whether you will write it. Please, I've answered you adequately. Thank you. Stop playing to the gallery. That is the Attorney General. I'm not playing to the gallery. I'm asking a simple question. It's about uh, applying the principle. In one case, you apply for an expedited hearing. In another case, related to the same matter, though, um, it's, it's fair to ask that question. Uh, the NDC's Director Liga is still with me. He is Eddie Tamaklo. Mr. Tamaklo, uh, you've heard the Attorney General. We had uh, the Nika Kusamado, who is the lawyer uh, for Dafia Mekpo. What's the party's position now, now that you've heard all sides on this? You are unhappy with the expedited nature which the Supreme Court decided to hear this. Now that you've had all sides, do you still hold that position? And uh, what's, what's next for the party on this matter? I think that your question to the arrogance of the Attorney General is the answer he gave you. You ask a very simple question from this arrogant Attorney General, whether or not for the principle of writing to the Chief Justice, you will write to have an expedited hearing in respect of the Richard Star. He says you are playing to the gallery. That is how he has misconducted himself in this revered office. I will say more. And that's the director of legal for the NDC there. He is Edu Tamaklu. Uh, where do you stand on this debate? I want to hear from you. 0551111997. And uh, if you're just joining us wondering what we're talking about, this was a major case before the Supreme Court today. It had to do with an application by Roxy Nelson Dafia Mekbo uh, asking the Supreme Court to stop Parliament from proceeding with its hearing when it came to the uh, confirmation of the president's ministerial nominees. As you know, the speaker had referred to that application and frozen the consideration in Parliament. The Attorney General uh, revealed to us that he had applied to the Supreme Court for an expedited hearing. The letter went on Monday and it was heard today. The NDC is unhappy with that because they believe it's double standards on the part of the uh, Supreme Court uh, when they've not done the same uh, for the Richard Sky case, which relates to the anti-gay bill. As you know, the President had said that uh, he will not receive that bill until that case is heard. What do you make of all that you've heard? 055 And George Affe is joining me with business. Hello, George. Well, hi, Evans. And uh, coming up in business, a uh, $300 million World Bank facility finally hits Bank of Ghana's account. But could this mean that the stalled projects will start very soon? And what about its impact on the Ghana city? And the price of cocoa surges above $10,000 a ton. As analysts forecast, chocolate could be next. But in all these things, why is Ghana not benefiting from this record high in prices of cocoa on the international market? The Business News on Newsnight is brought to you by MTN Business. Welcome to the new world of business, kingdom books and stationery, synthesis tanks and Pepsi and charcoal and herbal. Can you hear it? The freedom in our songs, the sound of liberty that rings from Kaswa to Karaga, from Tamale to Takrade. It's in the pestles that pound from coast to coast. It's in the busy offices, the crowded streets, and the noisy schools. It's in the wisdom of our elders and in the laughter of our children. It's in seeing how far we've come and looking at how much we can grow. It's in knowing that still Ghana go be. Happy 67th Independence Day, Ghana. MTN. 
Son, we are so proud of you for setting up this hospital. I really love those hospital beds and waiting chairs. By the way, did you import them? No, Dad, I didn't. I actually got them from Kindle Books and Stationery right here in Ghana. Wow. We also bought our office supplies, safes, executive desks and chairs from Kingdom, and they gave us expert advice on how to set up our office. Guys, that makes three of us. I also got our sofa and bedroom sets, plus our dining hall furniture for our new home from Kingdom. Wow, Mom, that makes four of us. I usually get my stationery items from Kingdom. Kingdom. And my teacher also mentioned that our classroom furniture was provided by Kingdom. So there you have it. Whenever you're thinking about setting up an office or acquiring furniture for your home, etc., Kingdom Books and Stationery should be your first point of call. With over 40 years' experience in the industry, we stock and supply a wide variety of globally sourced office and home furniture, stationery, and equipment. Visit our head office, Osu Akwaje, or our office near the Osu Stadium. We're also in Tema Community 1, opposite Olam SHF, Kumase K and USD campus. You see Cape Coast and now at the Marina Mall Airport City or call us 0302 764101 764292 in no de crack, in no de spoil. Call a cra on 0244-335-168. Kumasi 0505-555-666. Syntex Tank. A strong, a tough. Water is needed all day, all night. So, remember Syntex Tank all day, all night. Seven years warranty. Select any color for free. In no de crack, in no de spoil. Call a cra on 0244-335-168. Kumasi 0505-555-666. Syntex Tank. A strong, a tough. Hello, Auntie Araba. Hey, Boga, how are you doing today? I want to buy Pepsodent Cavity Fighter, but I don't have enough money. So what are you going to do? Can you give me the big size? You know, as for me, I'll pay the balance later. Today, no credit. I haven't sold much this morning. If you don't have enough money for the big size, why don't you try the 120 gram pack? There's a 120 gram pack? Introducing the new Pepsodent Cavity Fighter in 120 gram pack size. More affordable and convenient. Get yours today from any supermarket near you. Every smile matters. This advert is FDA approved. You're live here on News Night on Joy 99.7 FM. And George Yafe has a lot on what has been happening over the last few hours. It was a lot of speculation in the media about a, sh- a shakeup at the Ghana Revenue Authority. What more do we know? Well, if as what we understand is that there were reports that he's been sacked from the position as Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority. What we understand that issues came up about the consistentality of his appointment and what should be done about it and all those things. So you know there was an issue about the contract has ended, it's supposed to be extended and all those things. So what we understand from the presidency was that they were trying to find a way to still, based on the time that his contract ended and even extended as well, and there had been some official communication we understand to this effect. So based on the final communication to the authority and even copy to him as well. We understand that based on the the time that his contract ended, it has been extended to March 31, 2024. So as we speak right now, he's still at post. He's not been sacked. But what we understand that based on the contract extension for the previous engagement and all those things, that would end at March 31, 2024. And, and, uh, and the replacement has already been appointed in anticipation of him. Of him. So he has been away. sacked, as far as you understand. Any events to the story, the $300 million World Bank facility has finally hit Bank of Ghana's account. Now, Joy Business understands that the transfer was carried out this morning. This was after Ghana was able to meet all the necessary conditions that would aid in the transfer of the facility to the country. This might go a long way in the help in the resumption of some infrastructure projects that have stalled over the years. It could also help in improving Bank of Ghana's reserves as it has reached more than $6 billion ending February this year. The development could also go a long way in slowing down the rate of depreciation 
of the Ghana city against the U.S. dollar. The price of cocoa continues to hit record levels on the international market. The London-based Financial Times is quoting some commodity trading platforms as it being now selling above $10,000 per ton. But what is driving this spike and why is Ghana not benefiting from this? And what about those who are forecasting that cocoa prices or chocolate prices could be the next? There's more in this report. Cocoa was going for just about $7,000 per metric ton. Fast forward to the end of first month, it has crossed the $10,000 per metric ton. Cocoa prices have been rallying on the international market since the beginning of this year. This can be partly linked to the supply challenges that leading countries like Ghana and Ivory Coast are currently facing. These two countries have not been able to meet demand coming from the chocolate producers around the world due to bad weather conditions. This has also affected the production of the beans by farmers. But in all of this, why has Ghana not benefited that much from the soaring prices of cocoa on the international market? This is because the country has adopted a strategy that it sells all of its cocoa beans now based on projected future prices, which some call a forward contract. The development means that the country may not benefit from these rising prices on the global market. Another development that has even compounded the situation is that there are reports that indicate due to Ghana's inability to produce more beans to hit some targets, it may struggle to get the needed funding for the purchase of beans for the next crop season. And that is a business tax report. Now, the National Insurance Commission has indicated that it will soon consider name and shame of firms that are breaching industry regulations, including price and the cotton. The move is part of measures to help sanitize the industry from certain practices and ensure prompt payment of claims. Michael Lando is the acting commissioner of the National Insurance Commission, and he was speaking on the Joy Business National Insurance Commission Economic Dialogue Program. Let's conduct um, um, supervisory issues that we are bringing to bear on the insurance companies to cooperate. There are um, guidelines we've published on, say, claims payment. Um, when you submit your claim, um, application, for example, there's a period within which the insurance company is supposed to respond. There's a mm. period within which they are supposed to come back mm. and say whether they, they will admit the claim mm. or repudiate it and the reasons. And we publish these mm. in, in the newspapers everywhere. And they are being enforced. Everywhere. And, and they are being enforced. Yes, yes. Mm. And, and it is for the public to get to know what to expect when they submit their claim so that when it doesn't happen, they can make complaint to us to deal with. Let me also mention that when you want to make a claim, you, you, you are making a claim on an incident that the insurance company did not witness. They need to get documents in their hands mm. to be sure that this happened. Does it explain if, if, if the delays to, and part, It is part, it is part of it. Because to be, bring able this, to, make, bring that, bring that. to be able to make a motor claim, you need a police report and you need a medical report. Acting Commissioner of the National Insurance Commission, Michael Ando. Now, Omni Basic Bank offers the best interest rates to businesses and corporates ending February 2024. Now, that's according to the Bank of Ghana's annualized percentage rate report. There is more in this analysis. The annualized percentage rate, according to the Bank of Ghana, is the actual rate businesses and individuals pay on loans, including all charges. The data shows that corporate organizations and businesses that secured facilities from banks over a year paid an average interest rate of 33.6%. The same rate applies to loans secured over a three-year period. Access Bank was the best bank in providing loan facilities spanning over five years and offering an average interest rate of 30.5%. The Bank of Ghana believes that regular publications of these rates will enlighten the public on the cost of credits offered by the banks. They believe this could also help drive down the cost of credit as it might create the needed competition among commercial banks. And that is a business tax report. And that's all uh, for Business on News Night. Ladies and gentlemen, Telecell is here! Telecell, connecting energies. The question is not why South Africa. 
The real question is how you South Africa. How you'll come across a thousand tongues that all speak in one voice. Welcome. How you can wake up with one foot firmly planted in the Indian Ocean and the other in the Atlantic Ocean. How diamonds and couture are but a stone's throw away from the safari. How your tongue will visit a million destinations on one plate. How your feet will sway in djembe, your torso in amapiano, and your mind in bliss. How crystal clear rivers flow in the day and crystal flows in the night. Whoa. We know this because this is how we South Africa every single day. And this is why we invite you to South Africa with us. On your moments in South Africa, visa free this Easter holiday. Explore new holiday deals at SouthAfrica.net. Come journey with us. Recoded to do more with ease. The enhanced GCB mobile app. Download now from Google Play Store or Apple Store for all your transactions. Smooth, safe, and secure. Chale, tap the app. You don't need to have an account to upgrade. GCB Mobile App. Recode it to do more. Upgrade your style. GCB Bank. Your bank for life. You're still live here on New Snyder's on Joy 99.7 FM. Now, members of the Locked Up Investment Holders Forum have today clashed with the security at the Finance Ministry as personnel prevented the protesters from entering the ministry. The group marched to the Finance Ministry after meeting the governor of the Bank of Ghana. They wanted to deliberate over how to re retrieve their monies locked up with some financial houses and microfinance companies. We'll get details of all that shortly. But first, listen to some customers who say they are now unable to take care of their financial and health needs. Not Ghanaians, are we? Are we not Ghanaians? Are they any Ghana for? I am paying for the Ababedu or Bianchi Bianchi. Yeah, in two weeks time. Oh my shay any my yeah, that how copy him say, yeah, but you yes sika. Can I yes say for investment? And yes say for investment. Yeah, G yes sika. And DK, yeah, G yes sika. If only they will listen to us. They are wicked people. Because if somebody should work, I worked for about 35 years with the VR as a technical engineer. You see my helmet? So all this money that I accrued. When I retired and it was given to me, I deposit everything so that as and when I need it, I can go there. And also to rely on it at this my old age. Right now I'm 68 years. You can imagine this. So this is what I saved money with NDK Financial Services with the intention that when I come on pension, I'll be able to rely on income from that to help me to supplement my pension. Unfortunately, I have not been able to get the money that I invested um, in ADK Financial Services um, for over four years now. So I'm left with no alternative but to, you know, pick it for it. Uh, James Avedji was with them and he's in the studio with me right now. Let's talk about what happened in the finance ministry. They were successful in uh, meeting the governor, but then they wanted to go to the finance ministry and, and then there was this uh, scaffold between themselves and the police. What happened? Yes, uh, Evan, so when they got there, uh, I mean, there were some police, internal police uh, officers as well, uh, internal security as well as police officers in uniform who were manning the gate. And So when they got there, the gate was shut at them, not allowing anyone entry into the place. That led to some back and forth between Dr. Anani Entry himself and then the security of the ministry. We want your name! We want your name! Is it your minister who said we shouldn't come or you are saying, what is what's, what's the authority for you to lock the place? That Some people, we are not saying all of us are coming. Ten people are coming to meet the minister because we have written to the minister. And you are saying what? It's not there, uh, it's out. It, the minister is up. Master, you don't need to be working here. It means you don't even understand organization. You don't un understand organization. You shouldn't be here. You that should be fired. If I want to meet the minister and he's not there, hello, there should hello. be a human being who will represent the minister. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you are employed here. Hello. You shouldn't be here because you don't understand, you don't understand organization. To say, to say minister is not there and so what? The, the minister is not there. There's nobody in this. I'm, I'm, I'm announcing this to the whole, the whole world. Doc, what's the issue? 
Yes, yeah, sir. I, I can't you, understand. The information he's giving If you don't know, work, we don't come not, here and say, I'm a small boy. He said we don't have any appointment. I, I, I myself, I myself brought a letter here. No, not next you, sir. This is a public officer, you should know. I was also a public officer, but now I retire. The issue is that we want to meet the minister and someone who I don't know the capacity in which he is talking. Say, I don't have a meeting with the minister because I haven't even informed the minister. And I, I, I brought a letter to the minister's office last Friday announcing that these people will come. The governor knows that the minister has received the letter and the minister knows we are coming here. Then somebody sitting here say, no, we don't have any appointment. We are waiting. I'm forgiving them. Somebody say they are bringing some people to come and meet us. I'm waiting for some few minutes and see what happens. So how was this resolved? Uh, finally, they were allowed, uh, some 10 of them were allowed to get into the premises. They went in there and in just about five minutes, they came back to address the media, telling us that they haven't met none of them, either the minister, deputy, some of who have been vetted but not approved yet, the chief director or no senior officer of the ministry. He tells us their next line of action. Okay. So we are going away. We will find another time to come to the ministry. Now we have seen the Bank of Ghana doesn't have a challenge. It is the government that might provide sufficient funds for the Bank of Ghana to revoke. So we will be coming here. How soon? Have, have, How soon are you returning here? We, we, according to our plan, it's two weeks. So if we didn't get them today, next week, it is here that we are coming. We won't even go to the Bank of Ghana. We will come here directly because this is where we need the assurance from government that I will provide funds so that Bank of Ghana can revoke these licenses. So we will be here. But they met the governor. Yes. What did they get out of that meeting? They tells us that the governor actually accepted their proposal to revoke the licenses of the financial institutions in question. They say that the governor said they are in the process of doing that, but they needed some assurance from government through the finance ministry that, listen, if we do this, the government has the money ready to pay the customers. And so they needed that assurance from the government through the finance ministry that there is money sitting down there for them to use to pay customers before they can trigger that process of revoking the licenses and that is what they've gone to the finance ministry to negotiate for before meeting the absence of the minister and the officials okay yeah thank you very much you're still live your news tonight on joy 99.7 fm and there is still some stalemate when it comes to the teachers strike and we're getting the latest on this there's no end in sight now as they another meeting today uh, did not end uh, properly uh, in fact the meeting was called to try and resolve this still the teachers are on strike uh, this is a result of the teachers refusal to call off this industrial action yesterday's meeting ended with three out of the nine demands being met by government according to the fair wages and salaries commission the requirement for the negotiation of the six outstanding demands was for NAGRAT, NAT, and CCT to suspend the action. Per the directive given by the Labour Commission, that was yesterday, we were directed to meet um, the teacher unions who are on strike. Indeed, certain specific directives were given by the Commission. One specifically was for the teacher unions to call off the strike in order for us to continue our engagement. And the second was to meet today, which is Wednesday, 2 p.m., which, of course, we have complied. The very reason why you are also here. Indeed, one of the directive, which was for them to call off the strike to allow us to continue our engagement, the teacher unions have not complied. Indeed, because of that, we cannot continue with the negotiations. Indeed, they explained that they have to go through certain procedures to get um, themselves call of the strike, which was to consult their respective council. Mm. They tabled that, and indeed, they were going to meet their council. Um, because of that, we have also indicated that then they have to do that needful directive provided by NLC for us to continue with the engagement. The final point was that if indeed they are able to call off the strike, we are ever ready as a government team to meet them even today or tomorrow. I mean, the, the biggest casualties in this is the students who 
uh, for example, the JHS three students, they have about three three months to write the BEC and all that. They are all being affected in this. Don't you at least consider them in these negotiations? So that is why in the wisdom of uh, the Labour Commission, they directed that they should call off the strike, get back to the classrooms and teach for the sake of um, our kids so that we can also continue with the engagement. So long as they don't call up a strike, you are also not going to... Indeed, you were here. They have promised that they are going to meet their respective council and to do the needful for us to continue. And we have also indicated that if they are able to call up the strike, even today, we are going to engage them. And that's Professor Charles Adabo Opon. He is the head of grievances and negotiations at the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission. My colleague, Kenneth JC, was there for us at the Employment and Labor Relations Ministry where this meeting was held. And he joins me in the studio. How did the teachers react to the outcome? Well, I would say the teachers were obviously not happy when they stormed out of the meeting. They said that they were not giving any audience to the media. But their demeanor, their expressions did indicate that what they were expecting were not, you know, heeded to. But uh, we do recall that when the NLC met them and uh, met three of uh, their nine demands, they did indicate that if there's going to be further negotiations, they will have to call off their strike, and they did not. So government is saying that it is ever ready to come back to the negotiation table if they are able to fulfill that. So the teachers uh, did not utter a word after the meeting, but... They were not happy. Well, while this whole impasse lingers on, at the heart of this are the children. Yes. The parents are now speaking up about the... It's been a week now yes. since the strike was called, and the kids are still in school without supervision. Yes. Listen to a few parents we spoke to. Sometimes you have to give uh, pocket money to your child or your world to go to school, but you come back without learning anything. And so we need to really going to affect them academically. The time that I'm in school, I didn't see this kind of thing before. Small teacher will go strike. By looking at the thing, teachers been in the house and they're also in the house. I think it will affect their academic power. We plead to the government to address the concerns of the teachers. The children are home doing nothing much, and that can affect your education. A few parents there talking about the Zampas that has led the, the situation in the schools to be a bit uh, challenging for the students and the teachers as well. They still remain on strike one week on. Let's do sports now, and Ms. Bao joins us with details. Yeah, even uh, just a little update from the uh, protesting volunteers. The executive chairman of the local organizing committee, Dr. Kweku Ofosuasari, uh, he's been responding to the claims that has been made by the protesters, and he says that the protesting volunteers uh, for the competition were misinformed. According to him, the letter that was handed to each one of them did not indicate any payment, and so uh, the, the and so the communication they later received that some payments will be made to them was a sheer case of miscommunication. He's been speaking to my colleague Haruna Mubarak on it. I won't fault them for uh, too much, maybe misunderstanding, and they were misinformed about some of these things. If they had the right information, I'm sure they wouldn't have conducted themselves the way they did. They've been very wonderful, supportive, wouldn't have been able to run the game. Yeah, so, well, uh, just commending them, but uh, insisting that they were misinformed. But uh, the president of the Am Wrestling Federation, or say, Sebe, has been, you know, calling on the local organizing committee and the Ministry of Youth and Sports to ensure that the athletes are paid promptly for the medals that they won for the country. Campaign allowance for the two weeks, thousand cities a day, is paid instantly. Then you leave camp. Now the arrangement they have is that the team will go and meet His Excellency, after which the winnings will be paid. So I, I hope and pray that this is done instantly so that um, the joy of the athlete, these athletes is not just about the medals they have won, but very often they have complained about treatment, the way others are treated better than them. Others take more, this is less. Uh, what we must also know is that this is a multi-sport event, and um, what it means is that you must pay every black satellite player $3,000. Yeah, that's Mr. Charles Ose, Asipe, over the events, that's it for sports. Thank you very much. 
Safe driving saves lives. Drive safe. Well, some commercial drivers in the central business district of Accra are pushing for the immediate relocation of drinking pubs sited within or close to bus terminals. They contend that the presence of these spots that retail alcoholic beverages make it easy for the drivers to buy, drink and drive. As part of the Joy News Drive Safe campaign, Stanley Nibleu visited some bus terminals and filed this report. Welcome to Tudu, a commercial hub situated in Accra Central Business District. It is home to several bus terminals, transporting passengers to many parts of the country. Drivers and commuters alike are the patrons of the numerous food joints that have sprung up over the years at these lorry parks. But because eating at these centers requires appetizers, it has given way to another thriving business, pubs, or what is popularly known as blue kiosk. Alcoholic beverages of all kinds are sold here. There are more than four active drinking joints dotted around the lorry station. Delali Akako, a driver who plies his trade here, is concerned about the many drinking spots around the station. He recounts how many drivers have made a quick dash there to take some shots of alcoholic beverages before jumping behind the steering wheel. For him, the only way the impending danger can be averted is for the authorities to relocate these pubs near the lorry parks as a matter of urgency. I'm worried about the joints being created just around the station because it's even nearby. So if a driver is on scale, he can quickly just bend the corner and just go and take alcohol, which is not the best. So if there is something they can do about that to, you know, drive them away, far away from the station, because their presence around the station is also a cause, a major factor that is making the drivers also take the alcohol. Some bar operators who spoke to join News confirmed the defiance of some drivers. They sneak to the sports to drink either a few shots or bottles on a regular basis. I drive a four on a particular day. A woman one one. But Obi Owa on co driver. Oko did ya na kakra. It's only few drivers who come to buy alcohol from us because they claim they want appetites for meals, but they stay away from alcohol when embarking on trips. Joseph Asari is a station master at the Numbos station at Tudu. He admits the existence of drinking spots close to the lorry stations, but denies assertions that drivers prioritize alcoholic beverages before embarking on their trips. The drinking spot, you know, I mean, the drinking spot in here, but drinking spot, it was outside, outskirts. I would deny the fact that there are drinking spots at the station, but the truth is that the spots are sighted meters away. We are aware about the National Road Safety Authority's sensitization, so we are careful not to cause accident on our roads. Asari said personnel from the Ghana Road Safety Authority and the police service frequent the lorry terminals to check the alcohol consumption levels of the drivers, but that exercise is yet to happen this year. At the Obra Sports Station around the Kwame Kuma Interchange in Accra, the situation is no different. The Ghana Road Safety Authority has indicated it will immediately start clamping down on drinking spots sited at the lorry stations. The authorities' intended action follows alarming carnage on the country's rules, claiming 370 lives in the first two months of this year. This is an enforcement regime that is coming to check drink driving and speeding. And it is something that, um, as authorities, we have identified and we are going to crash it head on. Drink driving is reported to account for 10% of road crashes in the country, a situation prompting a targeted campaign to effectively address it. Stanley Nibleo's report read to you. And that's it for News Night. Tonight, a few of you are joining us with your thoughts on the stories we've looked at so far. Just a couple. Uh, this one from James in Kumasi says, It's a shame and a double standard practice by the president to refuse to send uh, this particular bill, the anti-gay bill, uh, there was another interlocutory injunction on the e-levy bill filed by Honorable Mahama Yariga and co at the Supreme Court, but the president still went ahead to assent to that particular bill. And uh, we also have this one from uh, Citizen Sikai. It says it's quite sad that the uh, respected legal practitioner uh, will become the antithesis of the rule of law. And then you have... Gerald in Tamale, I think it's unfair to allow the to attack the personality of the AG. Uh, 
and uh, let him deal uh, with the issues. Well, up next is Strong and Sassy, and a conversation that you will love to tune in and listen. Age-related facility decline. 